If you could stand and turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And we will continue to us our series. This is, a, of course, a year-long uh, uh, series is Learning with the Master. And we, I decided the Lord just led me to stay in the, in the Gospels. Of course, we are in the Sermon on the Mountain. And the Sermon on the Mountain is a long sermon by the Lord Jesus. So, and we were almost done with that. We start on chapter 5 and we're all the way to chapter 7 now. And of course, and we see what the Lord says right here in Matthew chapter 7. Look at verse 13 and verse 14 as we're dealing in, with these topics. Look what it says. If you have a Bible, if you have whatever you have, have God's word. Let's look at it. It says, Enter ye in a straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go there it. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth into life, and few there be that find it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this passage of Scripture. Lord, you're very clear in what you say right here. It is for us to take it or leave it, to accept it or to reject it. And I pray this morning, again, if there's someone here that never received Jesus Christ as personal Savior, may today they contemplate this passage. They look at the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and take it serious. And Lord, they call upon you for salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, decisions, decisions. Right? The title of the message this morning is Decisions, Decisions. decisions. Life is made of decisions, isn't it? Right. I, I decided, you know, when, uh, when I was a kid, I decided to go to school. Well, your mother made me. I could have just ran and I didn't go to school. But I decided I, had to, I decided to learn, to sit in class and learn. I decided to have A's. I wanted to have A's in class. I wanted to be the best student. I decided when I was a teenager that I was going to be a good boy, obey my parents. Oh, goodness, I decided to marry. That was my decision. I wanted to get married. I made that decision. I decided to, we decided to have children. You say, well, God gives you, of course God gives children. But there's other things there before <laughs> it gets to that. But anyway, we make decisions, decisions. We make decisions about what people we make friends with. We make decisions where we're going to live. We make decisions about buying a house, selling a house. We make decisions about what car to buy, what car not to buy, what car to sell. We make decisions all the time. We make decisions to get out of bed, come to church. We, tomorrow morning, some of you are going to make a decision to go to work. So decision is decision. Life is made of decisions. Every moment and every day we are called to make decisions, don't we? Even in the morning when you are a little grumpy, you decide which coffee you're going to drink. You can be your own coffee at home or it can be, I can't wait to get to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> or I can't wait to go to Starbucks. Or whatever it is, it is a decision. Decisions, decisions. You know, it is sad when, when, when you... Uh, when you work at uh, Dunkin' Donuts and you, you, somebody finds you at Starbucks. <laughs> that is a sad, sad decision. <laughs> oh, goodness. I had a good experience this morning at, at Dunkin' Donuts. I, I, I went to this Dunkin' Donuts and I, I would buy two dozen donuts. I was in the drive-thru and I said, this is bad. So I get off the drive-thru, went to the side. Of, I go inside. It was four workers inside. It took me a half hour to get two dozen donuts. I was just there. Waiting patiently. <laughs> Trying to keep cool and they're like, when do all these people are doing? But anyway, and I think the, uh, the, the, the I don't try to put the kid down, but the, the way he was serving, putting the donuts in the box, he was microscoping the donut. I was like, oh my, that was good. I thought I was in the south for a second. <laughs> So decisions, decisions. Every moment and every day we are called to make decisions. Decisions, uh, small decisions, big decisions must be made in order for things to move forward. I'll give an example. John went to his doctor for a routine visit. After some time, the doctor uh, finally called John into his office and said to him, uh, he said to him, John, you need a, an, I need to send you to a CAT scan. I don't like the way you're... Uh, your heart is, and you know, when I'm, I'm putting the little, whatever, the little thing on you, I don't know what the, you call that, uh, I'm not medically inclined. Uh, he said, it doesn't sound right, something is wrong with your lungs, and I want to I catch, and I want to make sure that you're okay. John said, Doc, 
I'm just too busy, and I don't have time for that. Maybe next time. He, and the doctor said to him, that's your decision, John. Maybe next time will be worse. So John walked out the door and made his decision. What I'm trying to say is decisions, decisions. Uh, John, uh, and like many people like us, we postpone things because we, we don't want to make decisions at the spur of the moment sometimes. We get uh, apprehensive many times, and we, we feel depression. We walk away. We don't want to make decisions. But let me tell you, we need to learn to make decisions because if we don't, things don't move forward. All right? Okay, so you go home, or you left home this morning, is a pile of dishes on your sink. You go home from church, and you look at it. Let me tell you, the dishes didn't walk away or wash themselves. They're still there. And you look at them, you go, ah, i do it later. Well, tomorrow morning you get up, and ah, i do it later. Guess what? It keeps piling it up. And before you know, you get a mess in your kitchen. Actually, one time, I used to, when I used to work in construction, I walk in somebody's kitchen, and I was like, oh, couldn't walk in. It was dishes, uh, dishes all over the counters. It was dishes on the floor. I think what they did, every time they need dishes, they went buy it instead of washing it. But decision, they made a decision not to clean up. I mean, mean for my culture, it's got to be spotless, okay? <laughs> it's got to be clean. So... What about, I'm talking about physical decisions. What about spiritual decisions? Well, do we have to make spiritual decisions as well? Because let me tell you this. Life is short. And one of these days you're going to depart from this world. Life is short. And as you like it or not, you and I, all of us here, or those of you who are following us on social media, we have an appointment with our maker. And what you decide here on this earth... What, what the, the, what go to the destiny or, or make you where you go, uh, the decision you make here will cause you to, to go to the other side and, and we will go to one side or the other. And let me tell you, there's no middle ground. And I'm going to explain to you what I'm talking about. So your decision about your spiritual condition before God and eternity will be determined by the road that you walk here on earth. It is possible to make wrong decisions that to take the wrong roads to go to, 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 go, to go to heaven. No, it's only one road to go to heaven. It is a, the Bible says it's a narrow way and is a broad way which on many people go, of course. So what you decide to, to do while you are on earth determines where you're going when you depart from this world. So now... That shouldn't take any of us by surprise here. After all, we are surrounded by, of course, all kinds of people in this world. But let me tell you this. We are surrounded by that. Everybody, people die each and every day. Loved one dies. Friends die. And deep inside we know that uh, the one day we will go as well. The fact that you, uh, you will uh, not live forever is a common theme throughout the Bible. The Bible is clear that we won't live forever. If some people in this world, of course, different denominations, there are people in this world that believe in your reincarnation. I'll tell you what, there's no such thing. Once you live and you die, you're gone. Actually, if you go to James chapter 4, I want you to show you a couple of verses. I'm going to let you look from the Bible on a couple of passages here. Go to James chapter 4, verse 14. There's a couple of verses. The Bible is clear. Then you live, you, you were born, you die, and you're done. That's it. You have one chance to make a right. Look what it says in James 4.14. It says, whereas you know, now what shall be on the tomorrow. Look what it says. For what is your life? The Bible makes a question. It says, you and I don't know what's going to be tomorrow. You, listen. When I went to work Friday, I had no clue, Thursday, I had no clue that, and when I get out of work, I had to go to the emergency room because my wife uh, fell and hurt herself. We don't know when you get up in the morning what's going to happen throughout the day. Might as well the next day. So look what it says here. It says, for uh, whereas you know, uh, we know that now what shall be on the tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeared for a time and then vanished away. You see, in this world, we're so preoccupied with the here and now that we forget about what's going to happen tomorrow. The question is to you is, are you ready for tomorrow? 
Well, if you don't have Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, let me tell you, as somebody that loves you and cares about you, you're now ready to face tomorrow. Because if tomorrow comes, you knew the part from this world, you will never see heaven, according to the Bible. Now, go to Job chapter 9, verse 25. Go to Job chapter 9, verse 25. See, the Bible is clear about this thing. So look what it says in Job 9, 25. Now my days are swifter than a post. They fle flee away. They see no good. You see, somebody said to me this morning, Oh, goodness, we are almost in the end of the year. The days are just passing by so fast. It's the same 24 hours every day. You know what it is? Yes. They just go by it one after the other, and before we know, we're not here no more. Look, go to Job chapter 14, verse 1. I have a couple of passages here for you. It says, man is born of a woman, and in a few days, and full of trouble. Isn't that true? This world is full of trouble. Listen, you go from one trouble to another trouble to another trouble, and you say, I overcome them. Listen, there are troubles that really knock us out and knock us to the wayside. And we're not prepared for it. But let me tell you, this world is cursed with sin, and trouble comes after another trouble. Some people have trouble paying their bills. Some people have trouble with their health. There's all kinds of troubles. And listen, as long as you live in this world, there's always trouble. Job is right. Let me read some more other, other passage in, in the Bible. It says, Psalm 78 verse 39, it says, For he remembered that they were uh, but flesh, uh, when they passed away, and come not again. Psalm 90 verse 10, it says, The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength... Uh, there uh, be fourscore years, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Psalm 90, verse 11, it says, For who knoweth the power of thine anger? According to thy fear, so it is thy wrath. In Psalm 90, verse 12, is a good verse right here. It says, So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts into wisdom. I think this verse, if everybody in this world will grab this verse, and say, oh goodness, I have to number my days. If we number our days, the Bible literally says, think about what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't have assurance of tomorrow. Count your days. If we do that, I'll tell you what, there will be a lot more wisdom in our world. There will be a lot less hate and anger and all those things that are going on in our world. Because we know, oh goodness, I have this many days. And after that, I'm going, to meet my make, I'm going to meet my maker. Somebody used this object lesson one time. He brought a jar to church, big jar, full of, um, um, what is this, um, I'm the cereal. It was like um, little chocolate, not like little brown cereal balls. I forgot the name of the cereal. I don't eat cereal. Cocoa Puffs. There you go. Thank you. And he says, if we put this and put this as our days, and if we learn to, to number our days, think about it. Every day you take one out. You take one out. You take one out. It's going to come one day, there'll be nothing left. Oh, that's the way we are. We say if we number the count our days, there'll be one day, there'll be no more days left. So how many days you have left? You don't know. How many days I have left? I don't know. We just praise the Lord for this day that He gave us. So, if you're not saved here today, let me tell you. Think about that seriously. Now, let's look at this from several points tonight. Number one, or this morning. Number one, about this uh, decisions, decisions. Number one, two directions in the journey of life. There is two directions in the journey of life. Let me tell you. Look what it says in verse 13 of our text. Enter ye the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there which, which uh, go therein. Let me tell you this. God, the Bible says this way. In this journey of life, it is two ways. It is two roads. There's not a middle road. I know some people believe that is a purgatory. I'll tell you what. You show me in the Bible or you find purgatory because I want to read about it. There's none. I mean, I've been studying the Bible for almost 26 years. I didn't find that passage yet. I want to know what the purgatory are because this thing about no matter how bad you've been, you go there to be purified until God remembers you so it can take you to heaven. And we done here praying and doing all kinds of sacrifices. You want to forgot to remember them. I don't see that in the Bible. What I see in the Bible is a, a road that leads to destruction and a road that leads to heaven. Which road are you in this morning? So, 
In, a, in almost end of, of the sermon, Jesus teaches this Jewish audience, right, of course, that heaven is not a gain because they were descendants of Abraham. Jesus teaches them that heaven is gained by the road you decide to put yourself on. I was like, all right. So my great-grandfather went to church and my great-grandmother. They were members of this church. Or oh, my grandparents were members of this church. Or oh, my parents were members of this church. They were all baptized in this church. Oh, I go to this church. I go to heaven. No, you're not. No, you're not. It depends which road you put yourself in. Some people think that because I have gone to this church and because I put my name there, I'm going to heaven. Listen, folks. God didn't die for denominations. He died for people. So, many in our day want to tell us that there are many paths a person can travel through life. Which are? Many teach and believe that all roads lead to heaven. That's the teaching of our day. It don't matter what you believe in. As long as you're sincere with yourself, God is merciful and is a loving God. He will take you to heaven. It's like, you know, God, move over. I'm moving in. Well, heaven is not our place. We go there by the mercy and grace of God. But we think, like, God, move over. I, you know, been a good person. I met well. So we, today, when we do this, uh, many actually don't even look at the Old Testament. They just look at the New Testament because, oh, we, the, the God of the Old Testament is a, a bloody God, is, a, is a, a God that brings a lot of judgment, and God of the New is good. So we love the Jesus of the New. So we don't look at the old one, but I tell you what, it's the same God. It's the same Lord. So we, today we live in this world, I tell you what, Satan has a way of deceiving people, isn't it? No matter what you believe, you just long you're sincere, you will go to heaven. It don't matter what doesn't matter what you do, or it does matter. Amen. It does matter which road you put yourself. Yeah. You see, uh, many teach and believe that all roads lead to heaven, and it don't matter what you believe in, as long as you, like I said, as you sincere. I wonder what type of Bible these people are reading from. My Bible doesn't teach that. No, they are those who say that Jesus would never send anyone to hell. That is absolutely true. God doesn't send anybody to hell. God created hell for the devil and his angels. But let me tell you, people want to go there. Why hell is full of people? Because that's where they want to go. Let me tell you that this is another mistake people make. God doesn't send anybody to hell. We go there ourselves. Jesus made a way to salvation. Why we reject it? Listen, folks, why is a bunch of people this morning in the golf courses and uh, taking all kinds of vacation, I mean vacation, no, all kinds of pleasures out there, and they don't, re they don't even think about today is the Lord's day? Right. Today is the day we should take a side to worship our Savior. And I tell you what, folks, this phenomenon is happening in our churches, independent Baptist churches through our nation. I tell you what, I talk with people. They are... Closing down Wednesday night services. They are closing down Sunday night evening service. You know what? People don't think that they need God anymore. Right. They say, well, I don't have time. Listen, there's one thing that we do. It's the same 24 hours for all of us. Right. We make time. I guess that they are correct. However, Jesus corrects regardless of what what, what world they think they are. But let me tell you, Logan says in Romans chapter 3, verse 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, and every man a liar. As, a, as it is written, thou, uh, that thou, thou mayest be justified in thy sayings, and mayest overcame them, and thou art, the, and, I'm sorry, when thou art judged. So God is true, every man a liar. Of course, that's what God, God doesn't lie. God is real, God is true. So let's spend a few minutes about this here, about this road right here. This broad road, letter A, is a spacious road. Lay verse 13. Look what it says. is a broad road. Folks, it's like this. It's the current of the world. Everybody's going this way. And some stand up and say, I'm going the other way. The road that leads to destruction, the Bible says, is broad. It means thousands of people are going that way. Because they refuse to accept what God did for them. You see, 
The word broad means spacious. Jesus says it is a spacious road which is a person can walk. What does it mean, the broad road? The idea that Jesus is trying to convey is that the broad way is open. In other words, any, anything goes in a broad way. Look at our world. The broad way is right open. Look at the sinful things that we, can, we do today in our world. You know what? When you open the gates of sin, everything goes in. You can't do anything like you can, you, you, you can carry your baggage of sin in that road. You can do what you want in that road. You can please yourself as much as you want in that road because you're not accountable to anybody. And listen, you can be the king of that road if you want to. When you walk the broad way, you can be your own person and have... And then not have to answer anyone. Remember this is a song out there that says, it is my prerogative. Here's a song out there. It's my prerogative. I do what I want to do. Well, that's the mentality of many people in our world. They do what you want to do. Don't tell me I'm wrong. And today when we talk, we talk about this a couple weeks ago, about judging others. When we say something, oh, don't judge me. Don't judge me. So you can live life to the fullest. Go where you will, do what you will, and be what you will. If you live life, and, and you can live life and call the shots, it is easy way to live because there's no, no one to please but yourself. It is what the broad way is all about. And many people like that way. Many people like the broad way. They don't want it, nobody to tell them what to do. So number one, you went really in control on your broad way as you think. You are really in control as you think. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. And you had be quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Let me tell you this. Why people are walking in the broad way? Because they are dead in trespasses and sin. And all of us were there one time. All of us were there one time. We don't think. Like for an example, John chapter 8 verse 44. Jesus uses some harsh words for those who are... In the, in the broad way, look what he says. Ye, ye of your father the devil, and the loss of your father will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Well, let me tell you, these are harsh words that most pastors will stay away from. It. We don't even dare uh, call people these names, but guess what? Jesus said it right out. He said it right out. We don't like some, we don't like to say those things. We don't want to offend people. But let me tell you, God just said it as it is. It says that those who are walking in a broad way, I don't want to offend anybody. The Bible says they are the sons of the devil or the children of the devil. You say, well, that's harsh. Put up with Jesus. I, I, that's what the Bible says right here. Number two, sin and its consequences. So we think that when you, we are there, we think in a spacious uh, 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 road, that we think that we are in control of everything. Let me tell you, sin always brings consequences. Look what it says in Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not, God is not mocked. For whosoever men sow it, that shall he also reap. We think that we can live life in this broad way. We think we can do what we want to do. And guess what? There's no consequences. Yesterday, I had to talk with a lady here in my office, crying. She has a granddaughter, 19 years old. See what sin does? I'm going to have all the pleasure that I want. I'm not going to do what I want. I'm not going to listen to my parents. Guess what? She's pregnant. Guess what now? She doesn't know where to go. Mom and dad kick her out. And now they come crying. I don't know what I'm going to do with my granddaughter. And she said, she's even contemplating abortion. I said, oh, you don't want to go there. You see, sin brings consequences. And sometimes the consequences are heavy and hurtful. And let me tell you, these people that walk in a broad way think that, okay, they're going to do what they want to do. They're going to live in pleasure the way they want to live. And there's no consequences. Folks, there's always consequences for everything that we do. And this young lady is reaping the consequences of her sin. Sin brings consequences. Some people may think that's not, or, or it doesn't happen, but it's true. Some people think I'm not a bad person. Actually, I'm a good citizen, moral, upright. I live the golden rule. I just don't believe that what you believe. Okay. 
We can believe all these things and be good citizens and all that, but let me tell you, sin always brings consequences. God warns us of that. Even in a narrow road, or if you even walk in a a narrow road, or even in a broad road, we Christians, we can all go fall to the wayside and get ourselves in a load of trouble as well. Sin brings consequences. Number two, let it be, the narrow road. So it's two roads in life. Is the broad road is the narrow road Jesus is talking about here. The narrow road, God has a plan uh, for all people to, in this world. It's not like God give us the, this highway for us to walk in and say, do the best you can. No, no. Our God loves us so much. He left heaven. He was nailing the cross so you can go in that narrow road. My question to you this morning is, are you living in a narrow road? So while the broad way is wide and open and easy, the other way a person can live is the narrow road. You see, the narrow road, uh, the narrow way is exactly the opposite of the broad way. On the broad way, everything goes. People do what they want to do. On the narrow way, we are accountable to God. God is the one who is in in the driver's seat, and we are in the passenger seat. God is taking care of our lives. We are in the narrow road. On a narrow road, things are a bit different. The person who travels on, the, on this road has someone that you he must answer to. Listen, if I sin against God, if I commit sin, I have someone to answer to. I myself keep short accounts with my God. When I know I did wrong, immediately... I go to him and ask him, ask, ask him to forgive me. Those who are on the broad road, guess what? They don't even think about anything. They just do it. They just go at it and just do it. They don't think about God. They don't think about forgiveness. And actually, if you tell them something, some of those people, they laugh at you. This week at work, I told one, one, one guy, I said, listen, that is a grave sin. You should ask God to forgive you. He looks at me like he laughed to scorn. They thought it was hilarious that he has to ask somebody for forgiveness. See, that's how desensitized people are in our day. They don't, see, they don't see the need for God. They're walking in this broad way, and everything is wonderful. At least they think there is. So, notice some facts about living in a narrow way. Number one, uh, walking in the narrow way honors God. Walking the narrow way brings us blessing and power into our lives. Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 7.14. Walking the narrow way offers a, f- a far better life from a very perspective or a very good perspective. Let me tell you, some people think, I, th- I think even Christians sometimes come that way. They think like, oh, I'm missing out in life. I read my Bible, I try to live good, I'm missing out in life. My question is, Really? Really? Listen, I lived on the other side of the, of the wall. I know what life has to offer on the other side of the wall. I'm not naive. Some people think that sometimes we preachers are naive. I mean, I, it's a common point. If you grew up in a Christian home and, and you, all you saw is Bible and everything, sometimes you can be a little naive. But let me tell you, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. My dad was a drunker. My dad t- did a bad life to my mom and my sisters and myself. I saw all that stuff. I thought, I live on the other side. But let me tell you, I got saved. The Lord built my house and my, my life and all that. I tell you what, I know it's on the other side. I'm not missing that part. I don't want to go there. Some people think they're missing out in life something. No, you're not. Rejoice where you are. You're in a narrow world. Let me tell you, honor God with your life. Live for the glory of God. Give God the glory for everything you do. Make God first priority in your life. Let the people in the broad road look at you in the narrow road and say, I want to go to that road. Because a lot of times, you know what? Our living testimony is the cause of where those people are going. Our neighbors, our family members, our co-workers, they're watching us. They're seeing us. And if we live in a narrow road, guess what? They need to see that testimony, that light that keeps shining for Jesus in this world. I tell you what, are you shining for Jesus? Look what it says in example of someone that is walking in a narrow road and went up looking in a broad road, thinking that he was missing out in life. Go to Psalm 73. 
I want you to see that. There is someone that is walking in a narrow road and he looked at the broad road and he said, I'm missing out in life something here. I want to go back there. Look what he says. Actually, go, go to just Psalm 73 verse 3. Look what he says. For I was envious at the foolish. So like he looks at, look at the people in the broad road and he said, I was envious of the way they were, they were living. Look what he says. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Or the Bible called them wicked or say, are the unsaved. Uh, so when I look at their lives, I look at their, what they were doing, their prosperity. Here am I here serving God and it looked like they have everything. Look what it says in verse 17. It says he saw all that. He wanted to go there. He, was, he, was, he says he was envious. I hope you're not like that as a Christian. But this guy was in a narrow road looking at the broad road and he said, I'm missing out in life. Look at verse 17. Look what it says. Until I went into the sanctuary of God and I understood their end. Look what it says. So foolish, in verse 22, so foolish was I, ignorant, I was a beast before thee. And look what it says in verse 28. But it is good for me to draw nigh to God. I have put my trust in the Lord, God, that I may declare all thy works. You see what it says? If you look at the whole psalm, he says, I mean, if, you, if I quote the whole psalm, I read the whole psalm, it says, this man is walking on the narrow road. This man took his eyes off the narrow road. He looked at the broad road, and he saw all the prosperity of those people in the, in the wide road, and he said, I want that. I want to go back there. I want to live that way. I want that. And the Bible says until he went into God's house. Until he understood where they were heading to. Why you want to go to a road that leads to destruction eventually? It's like going on a highway and it says detour, detour, exit, detour, exit. And you go, I don't know, everybody's going this way. I might as well go this way too. Let's say as the road ends, there's a big cliff. And everybody's going bloop, 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 bloop. And you're going bloop too. Because you ignore the detour. So this guy says, until I went to the sanctuary of God, I understood where they're heading to. Folks, let me tell you this morning. If you're looking at the people in the broad road and you think you're missing out in life, think twice. Right. Think twice. Because you are good where you are. You are right where God wants you to be. And sometimes we think that we're missing out in life just because they look better than us. Let me tell you what. When you deal with people, I tell you what. You see they're loaded with trouble. Listen, folks, I'm not a pastor my job. I tell you what, I feel like I'm the counsel of everybody there. Oh, they laugh and scorn and everybody and everything God says, but let me tell you, when they're in trouble, guess what they're coming to? They're coming to me. And I mean, I don't joke, I don't laugh, I don't make fun of them. I take it serious, I try to help them. Their lives are miserable. Their lives are miserable. The other day, one says to me, I said, seems like you have everything together. Like you drive a nice car. How could that happen? I said, I make the same money you make. What do you do with your money? And he started telling me, literally, what he does with his money. I look at him, I said, listen, you need to make some better decisions because you're really in a bad, bad path. Here's the answer. You don't understand. Yeah. I tell him, are you... I, Challenge me. What I don't understand. I'm older than you. What do you mean I don't understand? It's your choice. You make those choices. So like life decisions. or deci Number two. So decision, decision. Number one, decision. Two directions in the journey of life. Number two, two destinations in the journey of life. Look at verse 13. It says, Enter ye in a straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go therein. So according to Jesus, there are two roads in the journey of life. One is the wide road, and the other is the narrow road. Both roads come to an end. Both roads have a finish line. Now, folks, let me tell you this. Those roads that we travel... Either way, whichever road you go into, they're coming to a finish line. They will end. It is a destination. Listen, if I get my car and I go from here to my house in Florida, guess what happened? There is a destination. And actually, the GPS even say, arrived at your destination. All right? <laughs> if you follow the GPS, it says, arrived at your destination. My wife, she hates that stuff. <laughs> What's that? Sometimes I purposely put the GPS to go home and like, I arrive here. That's like, but, but it does. You know, 
So this road of life that we travel on has two destinations. Let me tell you, the old way that says that all roads lead to Rome, there was in the old way, well, all roads lead somewhere. You know, every road that we travel leads somewhere. Some roads come to that end, and that's the end of the road. But two roads in the journey of life. Let me tell you, you are either in either road. It is a broad road. It is a narrow road. My question to you this morning, which road are you in? Amen. And if you're in a narrow road, are you envying the ones in the, in the, broad, the broad road? And let me tell you. Let's look at this. Letter A, the wide road leads to a place called hell. That's a destination. Listen, folks, look what it says. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Listen, today we live in a day and age today that many preachers don't preach on hell. It's not a good preaching, feel-good message. Let's put it this way. We just don't want to give somebody an indigestion, so to speak. So we don't talk about hell. We just don't want to talk about it. We just want to give them a good message so they go out of the church rejoicing, in God good. And some of them come in lost and leave lost and, and, and say, in God good. All right. So, but let me tell you, the reality of the, with the Bible, and Jesus spoke about this quite a bit, is it a really destination called hell. And let me tell you, your friends are going there. Your family members are going there. Maybe your mom and dad are going there. Maybe your co-workers are going there. That's the reality, folks. Jesus said openly, that is a place called heaven. People say, oh, okay, I'll go there. I'm going to have my guitar, my drums. I'm going to have a fun. You boring people go to heaven. Well, the Bible doesn't say that it's fun in hell. There's not a place of fun. It's so not going, going to be a grand old time. All you a lot of, lot of close-minded people all go to heaven because we go to hell and have fun. Well, we're going to see what the Bible says about this place. Okay? So, for, so, folks, hell, like I said, is a doctrine, is something that preachers don't want to preach today. Well, let me tell you this. Let's look at here a couple of things. Hell, or this place called hell, at this destination of the broad world, look what the Bible says. A place of unquenchable fire. So you have the verses right there in your outline, if you have an outline. Mark 9, 43, Luke 16, 24. The Bible is clear. That is a place of unquenchable fire. Jesus compared hell to the outside the city walls of Jerusalem. The place, he said, that, that was the garbage dump of Israel. He says it's like that. I mean, worse than that. But it's a continual fire. And the sad thing, if we lead into this, is that a person who will be there for all eternity will continually burn and never be consumed. Number two, a place of memory and remorse. Now think about it. A place of memory. You know what happened there. And if you don't believe that, you've got to read about that rich man that went to hell and he wanted desperately to come back to go tell his brothers not to go there. It says a place of, of memory and remorse. They had the opportunity to go to the narrow road and they rejected. And for eternity, they will be consumed in that place with remorse. Number three, a place of unsatisfied thirst. Luke 16 talks about that. That the rich man was thirst in that fire. A place that you desire a, a drop of water and you cannot have it. This Broadway, number four, a place of frustration and anger. They will put that fist at God. Even in the midst of that, they still hate God. Number five, a place of unspeakable pain and misery. Number six, a place of eternal separation. It is no way out of there. There will be no more mercy or, or, uh, there in that place called hell. God's final judgment for everyone that decide to go in a broad way of life. Do you want to go there? I'll tell you what. I don't want to go there. I don't like pain. I have a lot of headache. I'm running to the Tylenol. Tylenol's in the house. Where are they? I don't want pain. I don't care what it is. Listen, it's a place of suffering. So these people, when they say, I'm going to have fun with my friends, I tell you what, that is a lie that comes from the deep of hell. That is a lie, and people believe that. And they joke about it. Listen, hell is a reality. Hell is a destination. And let me put this for the record. God doesn't send nobody there. We go on our own. You say, what, what, can, what can I do to go to hell? Stay like the way you are. Just, just. Live life the way you are. You won't find yourself there. Let it be. The narrow road leads to a place called heaven. 
Look what it says in Matthew 7, 13, Enter ye in the straight gate. Verse 14, Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that lead into life. So, as hell is a destination, so is heaven. Now, those people that say, you are the boring ones, you're the close-minded ones, you guys, all you boring people, go to heaven because we go to hell. Okay, look what it says. Look, let me just share with you if, and you, 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 you look at me and tell me if heaven is a boring place. Look what it says. Heaven is a place of no tears, pain, sorrow, and death. Revelation 21.4. Oh, goodness. Isn't we live, we live in a crying world? There's always people crying somewhere, sorrow, death. Listen, if we all look at the world the way God sees, you know how many people would die today? You know how many tears, how many sorrow would be in this day? Heaven is a place, no tears, no pain, no sorrow, no death. Number two, heaven is a place of, of no sin. Oh, goodness. No more bad thoughts. No more gossiping. No more tearing down people. No more that all that sinful body of ours will be gone forever. Number three, heaven is, is a place of no night. Oh, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Heaven is a place of no curse. The earth is cursed with the curse of sin. Heaven is a place of no curse. Number five, heaven is a place of, uh, of no... I mean, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, this is wrong there. Uh, uh, I think you're correct. Mine is wrong. <laughs> heaven is a place uh, with God and Jesus. Revelation 21.3, 22.23, 22.4... And heaven is a place of a glorious city. So, tell me, is heaven a boring place? I seriously doubt. I think I'm looking forward to it. Amen. I'm looking forward to it to be with the saints of all ages and with the ones that departed that I love and see. I'm looking forward to meet with my dad again. You know what? Heaven is a wonderful place to be. So what people think that heaven is a boring place. So let's go to uh, final point. We're almost done. Two decisions to make in life journeys. Okay, so number one, we see the direction in the journey. Number two, the destination of the journey. And number three, the des two decisions to make in life journey. So as we live this life, and let me tell you folks this way. I cannot make your decisions. You have to make your own. You follow that? I cannot make your decisions. You have to make your own. I make my decisions, you make your decisions. Everybody makes their own decisions. I might come to you with, with a, 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 a thing that, that, that uh, maybe that would be a, a appeasing to you, or I think it would be good for you, but ultimately you have to say, I do it, I don't. You make your decision. So there's two decisions in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in life's journey. So let's look at letter A, choosing to enter the wide gate. Choosing to enter the white gate. The reality is there's no real choice made in entering the white gate. When a person is born into this world, they, ent they are born into sin. According to Romans chapter 3 verse, 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, everyone is a sinner. Psalm 58, 3 says, The wicked are strange from the womb. They go astray, and as soon as they're born, uh, speak it, they speak it lies. Let me tell you this. You say, well, what about little kids go to, go, to, go to hell? Let me put it this way. We have one passage in the Bible that teaches on likewise. We teach us that when a kid comes to the age of accountability, when a time when that kid says, now understands right and wrong, he needs a Savior. Amen. When that point, he needs a Savior. There are people in this world, they don't even know what they're doing in this world. They're just, just existing because their mind is so distorted. We understand that they're little babies. They don't know they're even existing in this world. But when they know right from wrong, we need a Savior. So how you enter this white gate? Are you are born into it? You see, we have an ocean of multitude of people going through this white gate. And we have a few. It's like I saw a picture the other day like this. We saw humanity. I saw this picture, humanity. It's like a, like a river. All black and white. You see a multi the whole river was uh, people walking. And you see one against the current in color. And that's Christianity. See, when we receive Jesus as Savior, we stand up against the current that goes or the Broadway that leads to hell. So choosing to enter the white gate. How you choose to enter the white gate, you're already there if you're not saved. 
As much you, you and I deny, we are already there. Notice that Jesus said to the crowd here, many more will find the way to that broad gate that, that, that people will find the narrow gate. Listen, folks, simply like this. That's why God calls us to go and tell. You know why? Because people are not looking for God. People are simply not looking for God. You try, listen, we have to go and tell them the truth that Jesus saves. And I tell you what, let me tell you, when you leave the church walls, you enter the mission field. Your mission field might be right in your home. Your mission field might be in your neighborhood. Your mission field might be in your place of work. Wherever you go, you're rubbing shoulders with people that are not saved. And let me tell you, I'm not trying to be mean and unkind to you this morning. The reality is this. We love people. We don't want them to go to the, that place. We want to take them out of the wide road to the narrow road because they need salvation. You say, I've been telling them for many years. Keep telling them. Right. Keep warning them. Listen, folks, I took to my dad for 11 long years. We finally got it. We keep doing it. And we keep, as long as they live, it's an opportunity to tell them. So let it be choosing to enter the narrow gate. While the wide gate is easy to find, the straight gate is something that must be sought out. What I mean with this is when God calls the sinner, to, he, he, he draws himself to the sinner, the sinner has to respond this thing that, you know, we cannot do anything. We can, we can, listen, God did it all. Don't misunderstand me here. God did it all. Salvation was purchased and God paid the whole price of salvation. But ultimately, you have to believe. You got to repent of your sin and believe. How can you be saved with something you don't believe in? You got to believe in. So you have to want to get out of that wide road and go to that narrow road and just follow the Lord. Choosing the narrow way. Number one, it is an open gate. Listen, folks. God didn't die for a few folks. I do not believe in Calvinism. God did not die for a few folks. The Bible says, You so ever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you don't go, John 3, 16 is another great verse. And I'll and the, 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 the gate, the narrow gate is open to whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. God doesn't turn anybody out. I'll give you an example. There was a little boy that hurt. Don't think this is my house. This doesn't happen in my house, okay? Because I said, Grandma, little boy, no, no. This is a little boy that uh, stole Grandma's cookies. And grandma noticed that he stole the cookies, stole the cookies, <laughs> and uh, stole the cookies. And, and, uh, and he liked those cookies because they were good cookies. And every opportunity, he stole the cookies. And uh, grandma caught him with the hand in the jar and, uh, and a mouthful of cookies. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and grandma was not happy. And grandma let him have it. So he went home and crying, and you know, because if he got caught, I don't have no more cookies. I'm, she's gonna put the cookies away. So went home and crying. Mom found it out. Like, you gotta go tell grandma, ask her to forgive you. So there he goes. The little cat go over there, ask grandma for forgiveness. And grandma said, I think about it. <laughs> you go home, I think about it. Grandma was still frustrated. Cookies were stolen. Well, you know, I ate the cookies. <laughs> and I, but I tell you what, when we look at, uh, at God, the gate is open. There's no one that goes to God and say, God, I was so bad. I did so wrong. And God says, I think about it. No, he doesn't say that. He forgives all. There's no sense so great that God cannot forgive. So the gate is open to whosoever will. It don't matter what kind of, what color you have. It don't matter what language you speak. God is God of all. Number two, he offers life to all who will come to him. Look what it says in John 10, 10 28. And I give unto them eternal life and it shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck that out of my hand. Jesus promised that no one will ever to take that person out of his hand. Once you're in a narrow road, you're in a narrow road forever. You can look at the wide road and desire that, but I tell you what, 
That narrow road is your road. Number three, it leads to heaven to those who go through it. Let me tell you, folks, the wide road is very appealing. Pleasure is there. No accountability is there. I do what I want is there. It's my prerogative. It's all there in that wide road. And many people in the narrow road look at the wide road and say, I want to go there. I want to go there because I'm missing out. Listen, if you are Christian here this morning and you think you're missing out in life, I'll tell you what. I question your relationship with the Lord. Uh, is it hot or is it cold? I'll tell you what. If I, my relationship is good with God, I have no desire to go there. Right. No desire at all. Because let me tell you this. We think, listen, God gave us a wonderful world. Amen. Look at our planet. Look at the creation. We can enjoy life to the fullness and praise our Lord every time we do it. I don't have to go there. Why is a Christian that has been saved, been washed, been clean, wants to go back to the cesspools of sin? Did you ever look in a cesspool? Honestly, did you ever look in a cesspool? I have an opportunity because I have a, a one in the house. Uh, and uh, one day, I, 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 I'm, I'm always curious. The guy, I mean, this guy is gross as can be. But anyway, I'm going to give you this little story here. He, he comes out with this, opens the thing, and you know, like the perfume that comes out of there. He puts this tube in there, and he starts the car, and of course, you know what's in there. And he goes in his car and comes with a sandwich. <laughs> He's eating a sandwich as the thing, I was like, I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm like, you know, this is really tough. <laughs> he goes, I do this every day, and I'm used to it. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> He's there cleaning my, my septic tank, and he's eating his lunch. But I, but I think we should peek in those things. Let's see. We'll be curious enough. Well, the, some Christians or some people, they were saved in a narrow road, but they want, back, they want to go back to that road of destruction. Why? Don't go there. I'll tell you what. I'll conclude with this. Our God is a God of blessings, of mercy and justice and love. I'll tell you what. You can sit in a narrow road, and i tell you what. God will bless you beyond measure. Yeah. Look at this man right here. I'll tell you what, I have to believe in miracles. People say coincidence. I'm like, I'm a living miracle. I shouldn't even be here today. Because I believe in a God of miracles, a God that wants the best for you, a God that loves you, a God that wants to bless you and your home and your family. But guess what? We have to keep our eyes on that road. And at the end of the road, that is Jesus waiting for us. I'll tell you what, I want to go home. And when I get there, I want to him. Be there and say, welcome home and good and faithful servant. I prefer be a servant than try to go to the other road and try to be a king. I will live humbly. And like Paul, I learn to abase and I learn to abound. No matter what life brings me, I will continue with my eyes Amen. on the finish line. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much.